So last spring, I tried to use my persuasive powers to uh, encourage two of our younger uh, members to serve on the Vision Council. We need your voices. We need to move this community into a new generation of leaders. I was not successful. So much for Josh Larson saying, I'm hard to say no to. <laughs> but I thought of that ask as I read the lessons for today. Both the Hebrew story and the gospel are about a transfer of power, of a new generation taking or being prepared to lead. Elisha, the new untested younger one, is not quite prepared for this transfer to happen. Three times people say, hey, do you know that your master today, Elijah, will be taken away from you? Yes, I know, shut up. I don't want to think about it. Elijah, the beloved proven elder, says basically the same thing to him. Stop following me, stay here. But Elisha doesn't want to let go. Partly, I imagine, it's the grief of losing a beloved mentor, a partner in ministry. Partly, I imagine, he's afraid of being on his own, of Elijah's mantle now falling to him. Yikes. Partly, I imagine, he is wondering if he can live up to God's and people's expectations. Is he good enough? Is he strong enough? Is he capable enough? So when Elijah asks Elisha what he can do for him before he is taken away, Elisha is ready with his response. Give me a double portion of your spirit. Literally, it means give me a du double mouthful. I mean, they are prophets, and they do speak God's word. Give me a double mouthful. And then Elijah says this wonderful thing. It's not mine to grant. Look to see what God provides. Elijah doesn't try to hold on to control power. He doesn't think of it as belonging to him. And he trusts that Elisha can handle the truth. If you see me taken away from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it won't be. Elijah and Elisha's stories are centuries before Jesus and Paul, but we can hear in Elijah's response, Paul's line, for we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. This power is not from me. It's from beyond. It's not for me to give. This power is not for our own self-aggrandizement. It's power for the sake of others. It's power for the sake of community. It's power for the sake of the world. If we are one who seeks power or clings to it, we have to ask why. For what purpose? Are we seeking it for our own sense of self, for our own need, our own lack, or for how we can use it to empower others? Power, of course, is like money. It takes on a spirit of its own, and it can capture and twist our hearts. In the gospel, Jesus is preparing three of the disciples as Elijah prepared Elisha to pick up the mantle when he is gone. They're just beginning ministry together, but Jesus is already looking into the future, knowing what's going to happen and knowing what they're going to need. Why does Jesus choose these three? Maybe he thinks they will be able to handle the power, that they won't get twisted by it. Maybe he thinks they are further along on their journey than the others. Or could any of the 12 minus Judas have been asked? 
Ideally, in an organization, leaders always mentor other leaders. They prepare people to take their place as Jesus does here. So Jesus takes these three up to the high mountain, and there they are given a vision. They see Moses and Elijah. They see Jesus transfigured, reflecting this brilliant light, and they hear a voice telling them to listen to Jesus. So this is not a vision and a voice immediately understood, just like the vision Elisha sees. He trusts what Elijah said. If you see me taken up, you'll get a double portion of my spirit. But that kind of vision, that kind of power is something one lives into. If you've had one of those experiences, we call them thin places, you know, where the beyond breaks in to the here and now, I bet you didn't go around blabbing about it. Am I right? It's like, you got to figure it out yourself first. Like, oh, that was weird. Like, what did that mean? Such experiences are something we ponder, wondering their meaning. They're experiences that down the road we might come to understand or down the road we might need to remember and draw upon them. For the disciples seeing Moses and Elijah, the message is, here is the power you are going to need. Here is the power you are invited to share in. Here is the reminder that I am receiving my mantle from Moses and Elijah and God, and one day you will be picking up that mantle. This is my son, my beloved. Listen to him. So Jesus tells the disciples to be silent. There's a lot of silencing in both of these lessons today. Because he knows that that mountaintop experience is about the future. About that day when, like Elijah, they're going to need a double portion of his spirit. It's hard for me to read today's lessons and not think about our politicians or people who hold on to position long past when it's time to turn things over to the next generation. I mean, we do have to ask why Congress people still are serving when they're in their 90s. Why didn't Dianne Feinstein retire? Why didn't Ruth Bader Ginsburg let go? Why do we have an election of two people whose age is an issue running for president? I know there are political arguments one can make, but isn't there also some hubris, some inability to let go and trust the next generation? Why do professors or pastors stay on, leaving younger people perpetually stuck in the wings? When is it no longer about what we can offer, but about our own needs superseding the needs of the community or our inability to make room for new generations? It's tricky territory, is it not? Sometimes our elders have such wisdom to offer that we really need to sit at their feet and take it in. And sometimes they just refuse to listen to younger people, thinking if not saying, saying, you'll see, you'll learn. I loved my dad and I was very close to him, but I can remember him talking to me like I was a naive little kid, which at the time, in many ways, I probably was. But he thought that I would outgrow my worldview when I got older. Guess what? I never did. How often we have prejudicial responses based on age in both directions. The other night I watched Jimmy Kimmel and he had a segment of asking white people on the street how many black friends they had. And he pulled the audience first. Do you think this person has black friends? 
And the audience just assumed that young people did and that older people didn't. They were wrong. Or Joni Mitchell, age 80, recovering from an aneurysm so that she had to learn again to speak and sing. Singing at the Grammys. How many people see that? And you're thinking, she's not going to be able to do this. This is probably going to be painful. But it was a moment of transfiguration, of being carried into another space as she interpreted her song, Both Sides Now, with the wisdom of her 80 years and this stroke. Now old friends are acting strange. They shake their heads. They say, Joni, you've changed. Well, something's lost, but something's gained in living every day. I sat in our living room with tears just streaming down my face. And to see the effect this elder in the music industry had on all the diversity of people gathered in the room was like Elijah passing on his mantle to Elisha. Churches are in a unique position because ideally, always, leadership will be multi-generational. And our vision council is. We have this beauty of being able to learn from one another. As long as that dreaded phrase doesn't cross an elder's lips, this is the way we've always done it. Honestly, I haven't heard that too much here. People seem to know that the world has changed. People's connection to church, to faith has changed. It's a new universe in so many ways, and yet we are blessed to have a lot of young people who make up this community. Maybe we should start an Elisha, an Elisha group, a group of young leaders who, who might, like the prophet, feel overwhelmed by the prospect of leading here or in their personal or in their work lives, who might feel that they need a double portion of spirit. But you know what? Elisha asked for it, and he received it. Elijah is known for eight miracles, and Elisha for eight times two, double, sixty. He asked for the double portion, he received it, and Jesus says, you will do far greater things than I. The world changes, transitions happen in our own lives and communal lives, but when we offer them up to God, when we remember that it is about God's power, not our own, it's amazing the miracles that can happen. In Jesus' name.